we didn't do any research. You know, you would think if you were starting like this, you'd go into a library and you'd research how dolls were made for the last hundred years and things like that. We didn't do that. We just went and made it. I don't think anybody could do that today. I think the reason we were able to do it is because we were a little nuts. We had no fear. This product, in all its complexity, was born and created and had samples in one year. The action figure aisle in all of the toy stores that moms and dads go into was never there. It started with G.I. Joe, Action Soldier. He was the grandpa of it. The thing that is most surprising is the success with which this toy had in such a short period of time. Because it's G.I. Joe that put me through college. If it hadn't been for Joe, I'm not sure I would have been able to go to college. He's, he was our buddy. He was uh, a generation's buddy that the kids took to war, took to bed, confided in, and blew the hell out of. and in the air. There's a fellow named Stan Weston, and over the years, he and I became friendly, and uh, a very creative fellow, and he handled uh, the licensing of the monsters and the monster characters in Frankenstein. I wanted to use those and what we did is we would license them and give the companies a royalty and an advance and things like that. And in 1963, I went to Toy Fair, which is always in New York, in February, and Stan said to me, uh, come on up, I want to show you something, and we talked for a while. And during the conversation, he said, you know, Barbie and Ken do very well. But nobody's got a movable action figure, a boy figure. Ken really isn't an action figure. She's sort of there as the consort to Barbie. And he started to tell me about what he thought would be interesting. And trying to be play poker face, I said, yeah, that's very interesting. And I left his office and I said, my goodness, this is exactly my kind of thing. I think it could be exciting. And as fate would ha have it, I walked down the street. It was on 55th Street in New York and Manhattan and it probably still is there, there was an art supply store called Arthur Brown, Art Brown. And in the window were these wooden dolls that artists and sculptors and people like that used to pose for figure art artwork and sculpturing. And I went in and I bought about a dozen of those. And I brought them back to Rhode Island and met with a very small staff of people in my office. And I said, I think I've got something here very exciting and I talked about a movable figure. Uh, it just so happened that uh, Sam Spears, who was the head of, of product development, uh, Jerry Einhorn, which was in marketing in, in my division, uh, Janet Downing, who was sort of the lady that took care of us all and yet was very creative. He was presenting the proposal, which was, as he called it, a marriage between the Barbie doll, which is very, very popular, and military product lines for uh, small kids. Right away, old Sam says, I don't want a boy's doll, especially if you're going to dress him. I had a five-year-old son, my wife and I, at that time, and I couldn't see a boy's doll. He says it's to be dressed in military uniform. I said to him myself, and then said it out loud, that I think we should stop thinking about this as a doll instead of always refer to it as a soldier, a G.I. Joe. And I jumped up and said, well, you can't use G.I. Joe. That belongs to Bill Malden from the story of G.I. Joe. How can we use somebody else's property? Don Levine looked at me at that point and said, well, okay, Jan, use that as a name for now until we get a better one. It was going to be called a soldier. Immediately, I felt differently about it. A soldier with uniforms and stuff. And when I heard this, Naturally, the first thing that popped into my head was, hey, Barbie's got the girls, we're going to get the boys. This is G.I. Joe, Action Soldier. 
Here is the basic package, and an exciting package it is with beautiful four-color action illustrations. But Hasbro gives to the boys of America more than just a sensational new kind of soldier. Hasbro introduces a whole new concept in playing soldier. To go with G.I. Joe Action Soldier, there is box after box of regulation military gear, different kinds of uniforms, all sorts of battle equipment, authentic G.I. Joe material with everything from combat to bivouac, from MP to command post, helmets, rifles, tents, flags, sandbags, machine guns, everything carefully reproduced down to the last detail. But this is just the beginning. In this giant new concept, Hasbro brings to the youth of America not only G.I. Joe Action Soldier, but also G.I. Joe Action Marine, G.I. Joe Action Sailor, and G.I. Joe Action Pilot. Four G.I. Joes, four different services. Three or four of us had been in the military. I was in Korea and the boys were in the service and it was very comfortable for us to say, wait a minute, we could do a machine gun, or we could do a hand grenade. It wasn't foreign to us. We had been veterans in military and most times in combat. And everybody at once started saying, hey, we could do this and we can do that and we get uniforms and we get this and we get weapons and this and that and that. And for a few minutes it was almost like, like chaos until we calmed down. I think it was Janet or somebody saying, I think it's a great idea, but Don, Mr. Hassenfeld is not going to let us be in the doll business. It was violating a couple of his taboos, one of which was a doll, another was guns. Uh, we would love to get in the doll business, but every time we tried, uh, it was very unsuccessful. He always said, this is not for us. If we're going to be in the doll business, we better buy a doll company. We know nothing about it. Very competitive business. And my attitude was, well, this is not a doll, this is a soldier. Come on, Don, it's, it's still a doll, right? And this was the concern that they had. But as we started to get into this, the enthusiasm and the excitement started to build. So Joe was going to be the same size as Bobby, uh, proportioned differently, but that was the statue. Actually, nobody could really do anything until we had actual models, products to work with. Don had in the office at that time, I believe, was an artist mannequin. And he says, this should be articulated. And I agreed wholeheartedly. In fact, after I saw the mannequin, I figured this thing has got to be able to pose. But I'm not sure everybody else understood what I meant, pose. I wanted to him, if he was going to throw a grenade, his arm would hold that position and not fall down by the weight of the grenade. Or if he had a backpack, he wouldn't fall on his face. There was no reason to have a movable soldier if he couldn't move and he couldn't get behind the wheel of a Jeep or go into a foxhole or jump off a roof with a parachute. Up to that point, all of these soldiers had been plastic soldiers or die-cast metal soldiers. So this idea of a movable doll and the joints in the wooden doll seemed to be, the timing was perfect. If Norman, Walter, and I could make a soldier that was posable, we'd have a great item. A soldier big enough to really play with. But look, G.I. Joe doesn't just stand. He kneels. He lifts his arms to fire a rifle. He can charge, or he can sit down and rest. He can throw a grenade or crouch in a foxhole. He can perform every action of a soldier because Hasbro's G.I. Joe has 21 movable parts. His head turns, his arms move, he bends his elbow, his wrists move. He can turn from left to right. One of the key words in this entire G.I. Joe project from the very first day was secrecy. And that very first day when Don Levine told us about this idea room, we started talking about it. He said, we tell nobody, it doesn't leave this office, not even other people in the department, yet. Uh, nobody's to hear about this. Don't even tell your wife, your wives, because women go to the supermarket with their friends and they start talking, and before you know it, somebody hears something and mentions it to somebody, and next thing you know, another company's coming out with uh, what we're, we're doing. Knockoffs were very, very prevalent in the toy business.
We really wanted G.I. Joe equipment to be authentic. So I went to Don and I said, do you suppose we could get rifles and grenades and bring them in here so that we can measure them and reduce them to G.I. Joe size? He said, why not? I'll get Jerry on the ball right away. The first place I decided to go to was the armory of the Mounted Command, the National Guard Armory. The commander of that was the Adjutant General of the state of Rhode Island, Leonard Holland. Wherever I went, I had to concoct some stories about why I wanted what I wanted. And I went to General Holland. I told him that uh, we were thinking of coming out with a line of backyard toys for kids to play soldier. And gee, what a great idea. I said, yeah, but General, I need weapons. I want an M1 rifle, I want a carbine, I want a 30 caliber machine gun, a 50 caliber machine gun, and a BAR. And he just sat there looking at me. And he had a hell of a sense of humor. And he said, uh, who are you going to declare war on? I said, we're going to take over Central Falls. <laughs> but he said, uh, he called in his assistant, uh, at that time Captain Nick Anaselli. Uh, and he said, uh, give him what he needs. Drove back to uh, Central Falls and one by one brought the stuff upstairs and the, had to walk through the main office to get to the steps to go up to our offices. And everybody's looking, what is he doing with, her, with these weapons? Big weapons through this, the corridors, been weaving their way through the secretaries and everything up to our stairs and climbing up the stairs. All these young women, <laughs> eyes as big as saucers. Uh, we lined them up outside the door and anybody who would venture up those stairs would be facing all these weapons, the uh, 50 caliber machine gun, the 30 caliber on the tripods, just looking you right in the eye. And uh, that was our starting point. Some equipment couldn't be found. So I went to Jerry Einhorn and said, hey Jerry, we need blueprints if you can't find the actual item. Blueprints? Who is going to give me the blueprints? I called General Holland again and I told him what I really needed. And he said, the Springfield Armory in Springfield, Massachusetts, has all the blueprints to all the small arms in the U.S. arsenal. Take a look at G.I. Joe's battle gear, a new kind of action realism in plain soldier. All of his gear, from canteen and mess kit to 30 caliber machine gun, from entrenching tools and field pack to communication equipment, is all regulation gear, designed from official Army and Navy blueprints. And each piece of gear scaled to size so that it fits. The canteen cover fits over the canteen. The canteen clips onto the cartridge belt. And the cartridge belt fits over the uniform. This is G.I. Joe, Action Soldier. Then came the uniforms. <laughs> and uh, that was a little tougher. Where am I going to get the uniforms? I called the all different Army Navy stores. I called several in New York City, in Boston. And one of the guys in Boston said to me, there is a warehouse on the Chelsea waterfront where this man has a warehouse full of war surplus. Everything you can think of. I said, what does he use it for? He said, he's shipping it to South America. They, every seemed like every month down in South America at that time in the 60s, there was a revolution in a different country. And this guy was just supplying the stuff. He told me where it was, and I walk in, and I see, as far as the eye can see, mounds of uniforms and weapons and parts and everything. And all of a sudden, from my left, a little guy walks over and says, can I help you? In a voice, just like that. And I said, yeah, I need some of this stuff. He said, what for? So here again, I had to think fast, and I said, uh, well, I represent the University of Rhode Island, and we're adding to our museum, we're adding a wing dedicated to World War II, and we need actual things to put on display. He says, take what you want. Well, I loaded up the trunk of that car with all sorts of uniforms, everything, helmets, just stacked that trunk full, closed the trunk, said to the guy, what do I owe you? He said, hey, give me 20 bucks. I figured revolutions were very cheap in those days. What about his uniforms? They're just uniforms. Just the regulation uniforms. Just the authentic uniforms that the Quartermaster Corps designs for the real life G.I. Joe. Fatigue uniforms, battle dress, MP uniforms. Whatever the action, the real uniform. Mr. Hassenfeld was away. He was overseas for two or three weeks, which again worked out beautifully because we were able to, in a very secret way, behind locked doors, 
put this secret thing together. And one day, I'm informed Mr. Hassenfeld is back, and he's going to want to know what we've been doing to earn our salaries. It was quite irate that everybody in the, in the uh, management knew about the, what Don Levine was working on, except he himself did not know. We were upstairs in our offices at that time. We had sort of the upstairs floor. We had the art department, the model making department, and my office up there. And one day, and I think it was Janet, said, I hear him coming up the stairs. And we all heard Mr. Hassenfeld climbing those stairs. He was not a very tall man, but he was a very big man. And every step you heard. And Merrill came into my office and he said to me, how you doing, how's everything? And I talked specifically about everything but G.I. Joe. We're gonna do new paint sets, we're gonna do new chess and checker sets. We have a new stethoscope for our doctor kit. And he says, he puts his hand up and he said to me, wait a minute, wait. There's something going on here that the whole company is talking about. I'm the last to find out. I own this company. Please tell me what's going on. Marion, the secretary, was um, in the hallway office, comes in to us in our room and said, please get everything together that you've done for G.I. Joe. There was great flurry. Uh, the uh, conference room outside of the president's office was just around the corner from my office. And that was cleared, and Don Levine and his staff set up an entire layout uh, with uh, toys, figures, uh, implements, everything for G.I. Joe. And uh, he made a presentation as if to, it was to a group of uh, investors uh, of one, to Merrill Hassenfeld. This was about 4.30, we all left at 5. And um, we didn't know what was gonna happen the next day, if we all were all gonna be working there the next morning or not. And I took out the cigar box and I opened it up and I took out this very rudimentary soldier and sailor and marine and he showed it to him. I watched him to see what was happening. Every toy concept that was ever presented to Merrill, he would shift gears from the uh, business uh, uh, mathematical executive type to, to a child, and he really acted like a child. He would uh, finger toys, he would uh, move them, and it, it would, as if he had pudgy fingers, and it was amazing uh, how, how he, he would evaluate things. And he was fascinated with it. He said, my goodness, where did you get this? Where did it come about? And I gave him the story and he said, you know, this is interesting, but he said, wow, this is so different than anything we've ever done in the industry. And he said, I'm very concerned about this. And he said, let me go home and let me think about this for a while. And that's all I wanted. He was a beautiful, straight guy. And if he said he's gonna think about it, he was gonna think about it. When um, Dad first talked to me about his coming out with G.I. Joe, I sort of looked at him and, and said, you know, Dad, I'm not sure boys are really going to want to play with dolls. Merrill Hassenfeld's uh, wife, Sylvia, heard what was happening at the company, and she uh, had concerns about a, a, a boy doll, and she was given the very same presentation by Don and staff to convince her that this was a legitimate toy. And finally, the presentation was done for whoever the backers, finance people were for the amount of money that was needed because uh, this was, was going to be the very first time that Hasbro was going to be outsourcing to the Orient for the manufacture of an entire whole product line. This is G.I. Joe Action Marine, uniformed in camouflaged fatigues with all sorts of exciting marine equipment. Here is everything from paratrooper to communications, from dress parade to beachhead assault. Parachute packs, carbines, flamethrowers, camouflaged communication gear, helmets, and flags. G.I. Joe Action Marine brings a new kind of action realism to playing soldier. Mr. Hassenfeld had a big, big nut to crack if he was going to back up this new concept of G.I. Joe because there was going to be at least 72 packages and they had to be ready for Toy Fair 1964. We were confronted, uh, I think, early in the summer with a basic decision and that was uh, precipitated by a major product concept being offered to Hasbro uh, from a California designer named Ruben Klamer. 
And he came in with what uh, Hasbro uh, felt, what Merrill Hassan felt and the Hasbro team felt was a, a major, major step for them. And this was in direct competition with G.I. Joe. It was a shopping, a grocery shopping set uh, concept uh, with shopping carts and, and shelves, canned goods, replicas of uh, fruits and vegetables, checkout counters with recorded messages. It was a full-blown grocery store ex experience. We came upon the idea of play testing uh, the G.I. Joe concept and the shopping uh, store concept. And uh, the conclusion was that the supermarket concept had greater appeal than G.I. Joe. One Friday night I went into his office going home and we worked late and he was sitting in his office smoking his cigar with his glasses up on top of his head. He said to me, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to call four or five of the leading buyers in the country who are friends of mine. And I want to bring them up here and I want you to present this line. And I want you to be a big boy. If they turn it down, I want to forget about it. I don't want to ever hear anything because I would bother him every single day. Close to the fact that my wife Nan would say, you're going to get fired if you don't leave this man alone. I said, okay. And he said, I'm going to give you the chance at my expense. I'm going to bring these people in and we're going to look at this whole story. The key people that were uh, coming in to see uh, Hasbro uh, were leaning towards uh, the G.I. Joe concept. And as a matter of fact, I understand, I wasn't in the meeting, I understand that uh, Sears and Roebuck uh, flatly rejected the supermarket concept because they said something similar had been tried several years earlier in Canada and had not succeeded, and that did it for that whole concept. The attitude was, after it was all over, you've got a winner here. We think it's interesting, we don't know about how it's going to sell, we think it's very interesting. And that next Friday night, I was leaving the office a month later, and he's in his office, and I walked in and I said, excuse me, yeah. I said, now you be a big boy, and let's get this thing going. And he laughed, and he says, how soon can you pack up to go overseas? With Don Levine saying go, I ran out of the office to Norman and Walter. I said, we have a project, put everything else down. This has to be done tomorrow. How, I don't know, but I envisioned pretty much what it had to be. I didn't want any prop or anything holding this G.I. Joe uh, in, in a position. I wanted him to stand by himself and then assume positions and hold the equipment. Norman was very ingenious. He could do anything with box making. He'd make open boxes, closed boxes, set up boxes. He was really their packaging man and very good to have on my staff. Walter had been in the jewelry industry for many years. If he could make these small, beautiful jewelry, he could somehow handle it. Well, Walter says, where do I start? And I said, well, I guess you start with a chest. So he started sculpting a chest out of metal. From day after day, he and Norman would work together, and I, when they got in a problem, they'd call me. They'd say, Sam, I don't know where we go. We got the chest done. What do we do next? Well, I said, you've got to have some place for the arms to go. You've got to have a socket there, I would think. Now, start to try to fit the upper arm into that socket once you get it. In other words, it'll be a female socket, and you put the, a ball in there. Okay, well, how do we hold it there? And I said, well, let me think about it a while. You have to remember that this figure had to be manufacturable. It had to come out of a certain cost. Uh, if we made this figure and it was uh, $62.50, what was the fun of that? I remember there was such a thing as women used for elastic in their garments. Uh, it's called elastic braid. Brought them back to Norman and Walter and I said put these in the chest to hold the two arms together. And when, whenever you need uh, an extension to hold pots, use this elastic braid. I don't remember exactly what the formula was, but it was cotton and elastic. Now today, 35 years later, if I find a Joe and I examine that elastic braid, it's still functioning. So we were lucky, I admit, but it was the right material. The fact that it ended up being what everybody knows today, that it's the movable figure with 21 movable parts, that's become famous. I never said to anybody, make me a figure with 21 movable parts. 
I just make, said, make me a figure that moved and sat down and would stretch and do things like that. It just so happened to be molded correctly and economically it became 21 movable parts. Walter and Norman came to me one day and they said, Sam, we're at the hands. What, 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 do you, what position do you want the fingers put in? And I thought for a minute and I said, well, fellas, I, I think we're going to certainly have him shoot M1 rifles, so let's make it so he's got a trigger figure and something hold the rifle. And I looked at these hands and lo and behold, on one of the thumbs, the thumbnail, instead of being on the top part, like our thumbnail, was on the bottom. And the poor young man that was doing this was going blind <laughs> trying to look at these little fingers. And he said, oh my goodness, I apologize, I'll correct it. I said, don't correct it. Nobody will notice it, leave it there. So sure enough, he looked at me like I was crazy and we left it there. We made hundreds of thousands that way. And one day, uh, Jerry Einhorn came to me and he said, there's a shipment of characters coming in like G.I. Joe. And we said, let's check the hands. And sure enough, that fingernail was on the wrong side. People in Asia copied it the way they saw it. And we stopped that guy too. What was going to hold the various components in position. And they're really the only answer was a rivet to, to hold uh, two pots together. The rivet would pass through uh, the adapter and be closed at the outside. The only other problem we, Norman and Walter, ran into was at the ball joints at the hips. Uh, again, we needed something that was rubbery but and not slippery because it had to hold again, tension at that point so that if he were to bend over, he could hold that bend. Uh, I happened to, as a child, would take golf balls apart. And these golf balls uh, had in their center a small rubber ball. And it occurred to me that might be a right size and it might not. I brought them back to Walter and Norman. They drilled a hole in them. They fed the elastic braid down to the legs and it was great stuff. I don't think we ever improved on those rubber balls, but we had to find some other way of manufacturing, and eventually we uh, injection molded them out of styrene butadiene. When Walter was finished with the first one, the whole G.I. Joe was finished, all metal. I said, come on over to my desk, and Norman and Walter come over, and I said, let's see if it'll stand. And they placed it on my desk and he did stand. And his arms moved in positions, many positions, and he held those positions. I said, that's, that's great, I think that's what we wanted, but he looks terrible. He, he's a sort of ugly looking character. When I finally saw this figure go together, because you have to remember, I was seeing bits and pieces. I was very concerned that when a boy took clothing off G.I. Joe, which was part of the play value, that they would look at this thing and it would look like something like an automaton or something like uh, the bionic man or whatever, all stuck together with rivets. On the other hand, it, we really, we, we again lucked out. It wasn't smooth like Ken or Bobby. It was rough and crude like a boy should play with. It was more robotic. Florence worked along with us to four sizes. She knew how to make a pattern over what we had, and she made a first G.I. Joe uniform. And once you placed that G.I. Joe uniform on this soldier, he looked like a soldier, he didn't look like a robot anymore. I learned something. Little boys couldn't care less what he looked like underneath the clothing. Girls, probably with a Barbie doll, would care. But little boys just took it and took it in stride and that came out fine. So it never really uh, was a problem once we learned about it. 
We finally brought the metal soldier to Hugh O'Connor. Hugh started immediately building a one cavity mold of each part so that they might possibly meet Toy Fair in February 64. The immensity of doing Army, Navy, Marine and Air Corps. Again, Merrill and our people were concerned that how can we get it all done? I tell you what, I was asked, why don't we just come out with Army at first and really do a job on Army? I had been so involved and enmeshed in this, I said to my boss, please, let's not do that. If we don't do Army, Navy, Marine, and Air Corps, make a statement to the world that this is our concept, our property. Somebody else is going to jump in very quickly because they could do that once they see what we did, and uh, they will do the other services. Uh, we've got to protect our flanks, is the way I said it in the military term. And again, Merrill Hassenfeld thought for a moment, he said, Okay, we'll work it out. We'll get the finances to do it. We'll make it happen. When the metal model was turned over to Huey, it did not have a head. It just had the neck with the ribs in it where a head could be snapped on. Walter Hansen had tried a head, but it wasn't accepted by Don. So when they would bring me these faces, uh, and I'd look at them, and I, I guess it was wrong. I was predetermined to do something that was a general kind of all-American G.I. Joe. Uh, I never saw that. And one day, again, I believe it was Sam Spears said to me that someplace up in Massachusetts, near us in New England, was a very famous sculptor. I called up Phil Krakowski and wondered if he'd meet with me. He did uh, busts of Jack Kennedy, Curtis LeMay, uh, J. Edgar Hoover. He was certain a, a, a quality sculptor. I think if you conveyed to him what we're looking for, uh, he would be able to do this. Phil told us that it would be done within the week in, in what we call plastiline, rough modeling. So in about a week, Phil showed up at the plant and showed me what he had. It, it looked good, but of course Don would be the final answer on it and he was, wasn't putting up with any nonsense, and the attitude was, this is the head, if you don't like it, there's the door. When Sam came back from, uh, seeing, from picking up the uh, head from Phil Krakowski, and he had it on his desk, he was really, it was like he was holding the Holy Grail. I mean, he just really was just awestruck. To go with G.I. Joe Action Sailor, there are these exciting Navy packages. Equipment for sea rescue, for frogman, for Navy attack, and U.S. Navy shore patrol. Children will be fascinated by the detail in the regulation equipment. Life preservers, scuba suits, scuba tanks, swim fins, complete shore patrol gear. G.I. Joe, action sailor, brings a new kind of action realism to playing soldier. At that particular time, we said, what is the name going to be of this particular concept? So we had working names like uh, Ace the Fighter Pilot, Rocky the Marine, and at that time we thought, that this is pretty good, this will be fine. We had a very small advertising agency in New York that was owned and run by two gentlemen. One's name was Fred Bruns, he was the older gentleman, B-R-U-N-S, the other one was Donald Don Bruns. And at that time, uh, having some insight into what we were doing, Fred Bruns came back one day and said to me, you know, I think this is great, the buyers have seen it, but uh, you need a special name. By having all of these different names, it's like shooting buckshot. We're not going to hit the target. You need one name and forget about all these other names. And one night, I'm sitting in my den and I'm watching television and a black and white movie comes on. It's called The Story of G.I. Joe. And that reaffirmed, I said, wait a minute, this is fate again. He's doing something to us. We had a trademark attorney, Elliot Salter at that time, and Elliot looked into it. And we found out that the name G.I. Joe was registered for a comic book and it was registered for a candy bar. But it was never registered in whatever the classification is for toys, 22 or 23 or whatever. And we decided to trademark this and register it. After that, I went all over the world, making sure that Hasbro, that we own the name G.I. Joe. But the synergistic connection between the name G.I. Joe and what we did, 
I honestly say has a lot to do with why you and I are sitting here 35 years later still talking about G.I. Joe. It works. You know, when I first got those initial weapons, the M1, the carbine, the machine guns, we were supposed to have them for a week or two, but we had them for about four weeks. And General Holland called Merrill Hassenfeld one day and said, Merrill, the inspector general is coming from Washington for an inspection of my command. Are you going to give me back the weapons or should I send them to your place to inspect them? There was a gentleman at that time who was Vice President of Hasbro named Bill Pressman who had traveled extensively in the toy business. And uh, he said to Merrill uh, Hassenfeld, I, Don and I will go overseas together and we will seek out suppliers to make this. And we had a lot of hand samples and a lot of stuff that our product development department gave us. And we went to Japan and we worked with a company named Sanye. In Japanese, Ichi ni San, San is three. And Sanye were three partners that ran this particular manufacturing company. A lot of it was done in the island of Kyushu. And I remember stories that my, of my brother coming back from the Far East telling me of all of the trials and the tribulations. And Sanye would go out into small fishing villages around Japan, around Tokyo, and give out G.I. Joe's uniforms to be made. The mayor of most of these towns would, would ride a bicycle, and he would go collecting the clothing from these women who may have been nursing their kids in their houses. And I would go into these towns, and it was like Bawana Dunn was coming into the town. Everybody was putting together the clothing. And then they actually um, moved down the sourcing of it to Hong Kong, to HKI, uh, Hong Kong Industrial. I met with uh, some lawyers there in Hong Kong called solicitors, and I said at that time, I'd like to trademark and copyright G.I. Joe. And they looked at this and they said, Mr. Levine, you can't own and copyright the human body. I said, I want to own this body. And they said, we all own our own bodies. You can't own the human body. But what we would recommend is that you do something sort of special for G.I. Joe. If you could figure out something special, then we know whoever goes and makes it or knocks it off, we can stop them. And I thought about it right then in the office. And I said, let's put a scar on his face. Anything I could do to not make it look like a doll, I was happy. Because he was going to have a real grenade and a gun, that was going to help too. But a scar, he'd been through battle. And I threw that out at that meeting. But we didn't hear from that a long time. There was no scar, except Don wrote me a letter from Hong Kong at a later date saying, hey, we should put a scar on his cheek. Well, at that time, I walked over to Walter and I said, look, I took a pencil. It just seemed a natural place for a scar to be. So I said, here, put, put a little scar on this face there. Someone just uh, made a, uh, a sarcastic comment about the G.I. Joe scar and, uh, and everybody shrugged their shoulders and just laughed. Said, well, let's die. You know, like, let, let Don have his way. Uh, it was obvious the scar was there for a reason. And again, this was the, the masculine imprint. This was not going to be a pretty boy Ken. And that became very important and significant for G.I. Joe, which we did. Several companies did that. They copied G.I. Joe with a, they copied a doll with a scar, and we were able to stop them because of that. To go with G.I. Joe action pilot, there are thrilling sets of Air Force equipment. Everything from scramble to survival, and of course, dress uniforms. High altitude helmets, flight suits, pad and clipboard, air vests, flare guns, all the gear necessary so that G.I. Joe action pilot can bring a new kind of action realism to plain soldier. One of the things I was definitely so sure of uh, was the packaging and how we would present it to the world. I wanted packaging people that would just give this Army, Navy, Marine and Air Corps enthusiasm and excitement. And I have to give credit, I believe it was to a fellow named George Barton who has since passed away, who was in charge of our art department. He and Sam sat down and said, Don is looking for this and we're looking for that. And they came up with this a Thresher and Petrucci. The first item in doing the boxes was we have to come up with a logo for G.I. Joe. Harold and I worked on probably at least a dozen different logos. 
It was the final one now that you see now on the boxes, which actually was, I mean, choice. Everybody said, well, we're going to make it a little more, you know, uh, unusual. And it was almost like everybody said, well, let's put one of the G.I. Joe heads on top of the eye. Every branch of the service has their own little head on top and it makes a nice, nice logo. This whole project took about 75 different packages which had to be ready in time for the uh, toy fair. There were so many illustrations that had to be done. With, so we had a friend, George Eisenberg, and we called him in to help us do the illustrations. This rang a bell because it has revived my memories of an exciting period of my life aboard a combat destroyer during World War II. And I had so much experience in, in this regards, I was quite excited about getting involved with this whole new project. When doing the illustrations, the, they had to be authentic. So this meant we had to get authentic uniforms. We tried to think in terms of what kind of a person is G.I. Joe? Is he a person? No, he was America, the American conscience. He was the Army, Navy, Air Force, he was everything. We had to find some way of identifying everybody under one name. Now we had a model, so uh, we'd have, you know, different people pose in the positions we wanted with the uniforms. I found this pilot in dress and asked him if he would pose, and sure enough, he was very obliging. Got him standing up, sitting down, <laughs> running, doing everything. Uh, possible to fill that little slotted area that was given to me. This became, became more fun than doing the illustration sometimes because I did a lot of the posing myself but there were a lot of models that I, <laughs> some of these some of these people they thought this was the greatest thing when they saw these toys and, and they knew that they posed for for the pictures. Your dad didn't have children and be out buying the boxes to show or giving his gifts for Christmas to their nephews. And so uh, that, was a, that was a fun part of it. Even the Jeeps and uh, everything we drew was very authentic because we did go to the source and make sure we had the right thing. And uh, this, this is probably had a lot to do with the success of this. We had to get together the entire line, which uh, then consisted of 75 packages. They wanted to take it into New York to show it to various buyers to get their reaction. He took a, a group of rooms uh, in New York City, I think it was the Regent or Regency Hotel, and a few days before we showed it to five or six key buyers. And uh, Sam and I and whoever else came with us went into one of the back rooms and we were listening with the door slightly ajar as Don Levine and Merrill Hassenfeld and whoever else was involved were showing it to the buyer from Woolworths and I think from Sears. Uh, they're, really, they're really big guys. We were Sears Roebuck. In those days, Sears was it. There was no uh, Walmart, there was no uh, Toys R Us. It was Sears Roebuck. Everybody wanted to be in Sears catalog. We packed the stuff up and brought it back up to Rhode Island. And uh, several weeks later, uh, for Toy Fair, we packed up uh, six station wagons with the regular toy line on the G.I. Joe line. And uh, just as we were about to leave in a convoy to New York, Don Levine said to us, if we get into an accident, throw your bodies over the samples. We don't want anything to happen to them. There's an old truism in the toy business which is as true today as it was in 1804, and that's boys like action and girls like fashion. And that has never changed. So if I learn this in the toy industry, that girls like fashion and boys like action, what am I gonna do with this boy doll, as they call it? So again, Merrill and I sat down. We were coming into 1964 to the toy fair. We were at a hotel in New York City where we were in the theater of the hotel. There must have been a couple of hundred people there, our advertising agency, marketing people, salesmen, etc., and our staff and people from Hasbro. I think it might have been Merrill who said to everybody, let me tell you something, if any of you are caught selling your accounts and telling your buyers that this is a doll, we will not ship into your territory. We will make no, no commissions, 
it's over. The whole thing was based on would a boy play with a doll? So, no, he wouldn't play with a doll, but he played with a soldier. G.I. Joe was always referred to as a soldier, never the D word. The first thing that was needed was a uh, documentary film or introductory film for the trade. That is, uh, the, the major chain buyers, wholesale buyers, and the major retail buyers. Strictly people who, who would be distributing the G.I. Joe product line. The Bruns Agency uh, developed this, uh, this film. It was about 20 minutes long. G.I. Joe, reporting for duty, sir. Since the beginning of time, children have always played soldier. With wooden swords, broomstick rifles, with cast lead soldiers, with plastic miniatures. But none of these had the ring of authenticity. None of these gave a boy the feeling that he was playing real soldier. Give a boy an army field manual and his fanciful imagination will carve reality out of thin air. To make a boy's dream come true, Hasbro is proud to present G.I. Joe, America's movable fighting man. Thousands of boys will start with one service, but other thousands will start with two G.I. Joes, and even all four. Market research tests show that boys who have played with G.I. Joe want all four. And with a full range of authentic equipment, the four-way G.I. Joe line builds into the greatest open-end merchandising program the boys' market has had since the introduction of the electric train. G.I. Joe cannot live his service life and fight his playroom battles without the full range of equipment which is built into all four categories and sold in beautiful and dramatic packages. And to promote this revolutionary concept, Hasbro will use the most strategic advertising campaign ever put behind a toy. A campaign planned not only to reach every boy in America, but every adult. Plans call for giant advertising and mammoth publicity. Advertising strategy that will use television as though this were truly a battle for the consumer's dollar. On the right flank, G.I. Joe on network television. On the left flank, G.I. Joe on spot television in your market. And right up the center, a G.I. Joe print campaign in comics, in newspapers, in magazines. Total advertising strategy exciting television commercials, startling and dramatic print ads, a publicity campaign with stories already projected and in work for America's leading magazines to make every boy and every parent a part of the big parade to toy stores everywhere to see and to buy G.I. Joe, America's movable fighting man. On the land. On the sea. And in the air. He's here in the wonderful world of toys. And Hasbro's got him. G.I. Joe. It was mandatory at Toy Fair that no salesperson could bring in a buyer and show them the G.I. Joe product line without first having seen this film, because this was felt to be an, an important indoctrination to establish the uh, military masculine mark on the product category. Uh, we did hear some negative comments that some uh, individuals, especially those who had uh, relatives or children who were lost in war, uh, took it uh, quite hard. They, they felt that the, uh, the treatment was uh, very, uh, very grim too mil militaristic. Notwithstanding, it did its job. We decided beforehand, Sam Spears and I, that we would not just put this product on the shelf or on the wall, that we would do something Hollywood. That we would present it the way we would see kids buying it and doing it in their backyards. And we created what were known as these glass dioramas. There were four dioramas, one for each service. Within these dioramas, we had brought along rocks from North Attleboro and wood and, and dirt. And it, when they were finished, they were absolutely what a child would desire should he or she be playing with G.I. Joe. On the Navy one, we had an aircraft carrier with maybe 60 
Navy people coming off of it. Uh, with the Army, we had bunkers and we had uh, lines of soldiers lining up and fighting. Uh, and we did things like that. So when you walked into that Hasbro showroom and you looked at this, there was G.I. Joe in every position you could bend and move him. And that they went nuts over that thing. And we were short one, one item, which is uh, very mundane, but very necessary in any line of business, and that's a catalog. We didn't have a, uh, a catalog ready for one very good reason, and this was a, a problem of security. And, and I must say that uh, on this score, Don, Don didn't help too much because uh, throughout the, uh, the summer and fall preceding Toy Show, uh, even, though we, even though we'd had play tested G.I. Joe, and even that was difficult because Don was uh, uh, almost paranoid about uh, the idea seeping out and someone would pick up on it and beat us to the punch. We went away from Toy Fair with sort of something called light and polite. They bought, they were polite, they bought light and they said if it does well uh, we'll stand behind you but we want to try it. I believe our marketing and advertising people decided to try some television in New York City uh, and do some local advertising. And strangely enough, the first commercials uh, presented to, uh, to us at Toy Show uh, in the form of storyboards and an informal presentation uh, were rather uh, um, kidsy. Uh, I recall that they, they were using a parallel uh, of the uh, Speedy Alka-Seltzer commercial, which was then current, uh, where uh, Speedy was an animated figure. I guess that was the, the rationale, and G.I. Joe would be an animated figure who would pop up and just maybe talk to camera. And this was uh, rejected very, very, uh, uh, very, very soundly by everybody at, at the Hasbro team, especially uh, Don Levine. Don Levine didn't like this at all. So. Uh, uh, the agency went back and uh, continued in the same vein as the documentary film and developed a, a series of combat scenes with a central character uh, of G.I. Joe, who was the hero. G.I. Joe, G.I. Joe, fighting man for men to go on the land, on the sea, in the air. G.I. Joe, attack! Go, go! G.I. Joe, take battle! Bam, bam! Terrific battle! Terrific equipment to have a battle with. When you get G.I. Joe and the authentic G.I. Joe equipment, you'll have the greatest realism, the greatest fun you ever had in playing soldier. Box after box of authentic uniforms and equipment so you can change your G.I. Joe soldier into a camouflage marine ready for battle. A Navy frogman with complete scuba suit and inflatable life raft. An Air Force pilot with high altitude helmet and air vest. Get G.I. Joe and get G.I. Joe equipment so you can set up exciting battle action whenever you want. Remember, only G.I. Joe is G.I. Joe. Once that commercial came on, and you got to remember it was just in New York City a few times, it blew everybody away. The items had to go on allotment. In other words, a bar couldn't come in and say, I want uh, as many as I can get. It's whatever we will allow you. To get because we've got to spread it out. When G.I. Joe finished his first year, the company and I was doing 60 million a year. It was a threefold increase. I give my dad such credit because there were many other people that said, you know, a, a doll won't ever sell. And then I can remember a number of years later working with U.S. Customs um, because for years, uh, what we now call action figures were classified as dolls and, you know, how quickly you change the way you think. I can remember passionately discussing that, darn it, G.I. Joe is not a doll. It's an action figure. Can't you get that through your heads? And we finally got it changed, actually, out of the doll category.
get into the second year, it was up to us to accessorize Joe. What are we going to do the second year? We decided to do a Jeep. It was unnatural to have a Jeep. I mean, how can a soldier be a soldier without a Jeep? We decided to mount on the Jeep a 105 millimeter recoilless rifle. Again, where are we going to get this? Well, back to the armory of the mounted commands in North Main Street in General Holland. And they happened to have just what we needed, the, uh, the Jeep, the trailer. That thing was driven to the back parking lot of Hasbro. And everybody came down with their cameras and took pictures and made sketches and this and that because it had to go back. It turned out a very nice project with its trailer and gun. With G.I. Joe in the seat of the Jeep, you couldn't see anything more realistic. One of the things that are interesting is that I wanted the scuba suit, the black scuba suit, which was orange at one time and black in another, to be actual rubber. And that was unheard of years ago. How are we going to make it? And I showed it to our Oriental friends, and they looked at it and they said, Mr. Levine, uh, we can, we'll make this out of plastic, out of vinyl. And I said, no, I want it in rubber. And they said, the only place you can make this is out near Singapore, in Kuala Lumpur. And this is where they make the rubber gloves that your wife uses to wash the dishes. About two days later, I'm sort of slogging through the jungle someplace in Kuala Lumpur to a rubber plantation and with the suit, in a, you know, in a box, the rubber suit, and that's how we started to make it. And uh, we learned in Hong Kong how it was made in Singapore. But it had to be rubber. Bart Rizzo was an engineer at Hasbro. He brought home pieces from the G.I. Joe line, guns and Joes, and his son was playing with them. But the son was leaving them all over the house. Bart saw this and remembered that when he was in the Army, he had a footlocker. Bart presented the idea to Hasbro, and from that day on, they were making wood footlockers. It was a great seller and a great help to the youngsters to store their gear. Well, the second year of G.I. Joe, 1965, I believe, I'm sitting in this dark theater next to Merrill Hassenfeld, and a commercial that Bruns did said, G.I. Joe is so real, you can almost hear him say, take the high ground. And I looked at Merrill and I said, why don't we make him talk and say, take the high ground? He said, great, go find out what it is, tell me how much it's going to cost, and let's do it. So I contacted a company named Bolt, Baranek, and Newman, who were sound specialists up near Boston. I went to see them, and I had a little box, cardboard box, that had about the chest cavity of G.I. Joe to show them how much real estate they had that they could play with. These people were working on, on submarine sounds underwater so that uh, people couldn't detect the submarine. So they were really in this. And when I walked in and said, make G.I. Joe talk, they thought I was a little bit nuts, but they said, we'll do it. And they came up with this thing that was a pull string. They would play the recording of the man who recorded the voice with all the different inflections over and over and over for days and days and weeks and it went on it was like you woke up in the middle of the night you could hear it. It never really worked that well because if a kid took it in the bathtub G.I. Joe went blah, 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 like that and that was the end of that. As we looked for new product for each succeeding year uh, we, it was quite easy because there was so much to the services but one item I always wanted to make and it was my idea to make it, was the deep sea diver. Fire one. One's fire. The deep sea diver was just a natural addition to the Joe line. I'd been in the Navy and I'd seen these in action with the big helmet, the window, and the suit, metal boots and belt. I just felt G.I. Joe had to have it. The action of the deep sea diver, of course, was to blow air down to him as he was in the water, and he would rise to the surface and then slowly descend again. This made the toy very functional and certainly a hit for the children. With Don's permission, he said, go ahead, see what you can do. So again, Norman and Walter and I went to work. You're watching a dangerous underwater treasure hunt. Look out! A giant octopus is attacking G.I. Joe in his new adventure, The Eight Ropes of Danger! And it's all happening right in your own backyard! 
I was at Westport during the summer in my boat, and believe it or not, as I drove past this uh, mother and a child, the little boy had the deep sea diver over the side of the bo boat, and it, it came. I came to realize then uh, that we had really a toy that was enjoyed by many, many children. The dollars and cents meant something, but until you actually see it happening, you don't believe it. One of the items in the Navy category was a landing signal officer. His uniform consisted of a one-piece jumpsuit with two brightly colored stripes down the front, and we decided we wanted to do this. There was a naval air station at Quonset Point, Rhode Island. Uh, they had an aircraft carrier attached to them, the Tarawa. Drove to Quonset Point, and uh, I walked in, and the captain came over. What can I do for you? And I told him I had just seen Colonel Sortel, and I told him what I wanted. He says, yeah, we have him, but we have one problem. We have two landing signal officers. Uh, we have two uniforms. Both happen to be on the Tarawa, which is about 200 miles off the coast right now, just finishing up some exercises. I said, when will the Tarawa be back? He said, the day after tomorrow. I said, that's really too late, because the head of our department, Don Levine, is leaving for the Orient tomorrow night. And we have to get these things, duplicate them, so that he could take them to the Orient to have them made. He said, uh, let me see what I can do. And he goes into a room and he gets on a radio and he calls the Tarawa. Well, I need a set of paddles and the jumpsuit from the LSO. Well, we'll be back in a couple of days. I need it right now. They had a supply plane leaving the Tarawa in 10 minutes. Get those things on the airplane and fly it in here. He says to me, be here in 45 minutes. Sure enough, in 45 minutes, the plane lands. They hand him the package he brings over, he gives it to me, and I bring it back to Hasbro. Why don't we put together a G.I. Joe club? Larry O'Daly at that time was our advertising guy, and he started to put together stories and memorabilia and badges and whatever patches and whatever we could do. And he signed it Colonel Lawrence. He made himself a colonel in the G.I. Joe Army. And at one point, these envelopes with 50 cents would come in so tremendously that the postal authorities here in Rhode Island contacted our people at Hasbro. And they said, you know, we are a federal agency. We're not going to deliver these things to you anymore. We just don't have the trucks to handle it. And they said, Mr. Hassenberg, would you send your own trucks to pick up these envelopes full of 50 cents? And there were girls on an assembly line opening them up and sending stuff. And even in those days, it became this great phenomenon. I worked for Mattel from 1966 to 1969 for about three years and we used to receive really cute letters from kids and I remember this one particularly and I would usually answer them on my own time. Dear sirs, how do I go about getting a left foot for my G.I. Joe? He was the toughest soldier on our block but now all the other kids want him to be the dead guy all the time because he has no left foot. I hope you can help to get him another foot. Thank you, Shannon Childress. This is my response. November 10th, 1967. Dear Shannon, we received your letter about your G.I. Joe and we're very concerned about his condition. We do not make G.I. Joe here at the Mattel Toy Company, but we forwarded your letter to the company that does, the Hasbro Toy Company. So they will probably be contacting you about your G.I. Joe's problem. We're glad to know that you care enough about your toys to want them kept in good condition, and we can certainly understand why you don't want your G.I. Joe being the dead guy all the time. Couldn't he be sent to the base hospital until his new foot arrives? The other soldiers should be instructed to visit him often and keep him informed so he doesn't feel sad while waiting for his foot. We hope it won't be long before he's the toughest guy on the block again. Sincerely, Mattel Toy Company. Joanne Morgan, Personnel Secretary. A British company came to Merrill and said that they would like to use our tools and they'd like to pay us a licensing fee. And Merrill and I went to England, we sat down with these people and they decided not to use the name G.I. Joe because it wasn't relevant in, in Europe and they came up with the name Action Man. And 
believe it or not, Action Man is G.I. Joe's cousin, and it started all with us here in Rhode Island. Another extension for G.I. Joe was the sea sled. I remember seeing the James Bond movie, Thunderball. It just impressed me so much that Joe had to have a sea sled. We worked a model that, that functioned and would dive and take on water as ballast and expel water. It was, again, another success. As an industrial designer, of course, I was taught to make renderings and drawings of what we proposed, but many times we didn't have the time to do it. That was the case with the sea sled. We just went ahead and built models and hoped that they would function. Uh, if they didn't function, we threw more batteries in. I got a call from Don to come up to his office, and I went in there and Sam and Don were in there, closed the door, and Don said, uh, I think we ought to do an astronaut. Now, at that time, the astronauts consisted of the original seven. I think they called it the Mercury series, the first group. And Sam says, uh, you got to get me a spacesuit. I said, I got to get you what? You have to get me a spacesuit. We got to copy something right from the original thing. How am I going to get a spacesuit for Sam Spears? After about the eighth phone call, I decided to call one of our senators, Senator John O. Pastore. And he arranged a meeting for me with people at NASA at the Pentagon. And I flew to Washington and rented a car and drove over to the Pentagon. And two gentlemen took me into a, uh, another office and we were talking. And by that time, G.I. Joe was no longer a secret. And they knew of G.I. Joe and I told them we want to do a G.I. Joe astronaut. Well, these guys were elated. This was great. I said, but I have a problem. In order to make this really authentic, I need a spacesuit. Oh, well, they looked at each other and they said, we can help you with that. I said, really? And they take me into another room and there is a wooden box about seven feet long and about three feet wide on the floor. And they open the box and there is a six foot tall mannequin wearing an actual spacesuit. They said, we can let you have this. I said, the suit? He said, no, we'll give you the mannequin, the whole thing. We'll ship it to you in Rhode Island. I said, that is absolutely great. And I said, you know, we'd like to also, I need some more information if I could get it. We'd like to put a record in telling kids about space travel, about being an astronaut, uh, maybe something about a space flight. And one of the gentlemen says to me, hey, we could give you the tapes from John Glenn's space flight. I said, I listened to that on the radio. And with all the static and all, we could never put that on a record. He says, oh no, these were the tapes that were recorded by John Glenn himself inside the space capsule. Thank you very much, <laughs> shook hands, and I'm leaving the office, and I have my hand on the doorknob, and I hesitate for a minute, and I'm gonna go back, and I say to myself, they will never give you a space capsule, just leave. starring G.I. Joe and his action equipment. The G.I. Joe space capsule is down. Another mission complete. Frogmen and sea sleds are ready to help. Capsule sighted. Prepare to pick up. Suddenly the capsule fills with water and sinks. G.I. Joe sailors in deep sea diver suits are going to the rescue. In seconds, you attach a line to the capsule and pull it to safety. There's more trouble ahead. The capsule is radioactive. But here comes the G.I. Joe crash crew truck to wash down the capsule with the working pump. Kids, make up your own G.I. Joe adventures like the one you've just seen by getting any or all of this equipment. Capsule, deep sea diver suits, frogmen, talking G.I. Joe. Make up a different adventure every day with G.I. Joe. 
We were so successful, we were riding this success story that I thought we could walk on water. I thought anything we did would be successful. So again, we sat down one day, and I don't know it was me or somebody, we said, if little boys, millions of them and thousands of them are all over the country playing on the floor, why don't we take this phenomena and come up with a G.I. Joe nurse? Because then the sisters will buy it. Why not get into that doll business, which we didn't want to go up against Barbie? Originally, she really wasn't part of the G.I. Joe concept. She was originally going to be an action girl. She was going to be dedicated to the girl market, and she would have been a doll that I would have been mad about when I was a child, that she, because she would have bent and moved and did all these wonderful things. We could have sat her on a horse, a bike, or whatever. We did all kinds of outfits for her. I sculpted the hands, and I sculpted the head. The body on her, we wanted to stay away from the typical Barbie body. We wanted her to have a more youthful body, not quite as voluptuous. And again, knowing we didn't know too much about the doll business, we were, going, we were now experts in the boy action figure business, we created this nurse. She was like a MASH medic nurse, and we put this out. And I believe she only stayed on the shelves about a year because the she was in with the G.I. Joe equipment and things, and the G.I. Joe, and of course the little girls didn't shop there, especially when they had Barbie with the pink ball gowns. And the boys didn't even want to deal with her. <laughs> and it went no place. No place to the extent that I was going to do a G.I. Joe dog next. I figured anything, anything we did, we'd be successful with. Very next year at Toy Fair, the big news was that Mattel had a twist at the waist Barbie. And that was the beginning of the Barbie being more flexible. And now, of course, they have a fully articulated Barbie that moves and can ride bicycles and horses and all of this and everything. But we all had it first. <laughs> Today, if you have a G.I. Joe nurse and it's in pristine condition in its box, you can uh, send your kids to college for a couple of years on that. The collectors will buy it. She's the one who's the v most valuable, so I feel a little bit better about it. <laughs> Don and I had been talking several times about uh, not an enemy for G.I. Joe, but G.I. Joe was a World War II character. And in World War II, we were fighting somebody, we were fighting the enemy, but we didn't, didn't feel right putting out something called an enemy. G.I. Joe was never uh, promoted to be an aggressor. He was never fighting and killing and hurting the enemy or the Axis, uh, you know, uh, groups of countries. We always let the little boys uh, decide what they would do with G.I. Joe. They, are, they would create their own adventures. So at one point, when letters started to come in saying, well, you know what, we'd love to have a German soldier, we'd love to have a Japanese soldier, and a, a Russian soldier, we said, hey, their uniforms and what they look like are so colorful, let's do it. So we decided to put out a line and call them Action Soldiers of the World. We call them the Japanese Imperial Soldier, the German Stormtrooper, uh, the British Tommy, French resistance fighter, the Australian jungle fighter. One of the first projects that I worked on for the G.I. Joe, uh, there were other projects going on at the time, of course, because it was product development, but the, for G.I. Joe was the foreign soldiers, and that involved just making the heads because, of course, the bodies were universal. Uh, and what we, they did was that they wanted a Japanese face, and then they wanted the other face for the German Australian, British, French soldier, etc. And they wanted a Nordic looking face. And my way of referencing that was um, to actually cut out pictures from magazines was my best thing and make a kind of a picture board up of, of young, young men who looked to me like, <laughs> I can't remember who they were exactly, but uh, young, nice looking men. We did change this, the artwork style which was quite noticeable. And it ended up being the best style, I think, that we used on all the illustrations, because there was a lot of freedom to it. We knew the kids were told how bad the Japanese were and the Germans. And I know I did the Japanese one, and I really wanted him to look like he was me, you know. And uh, the British one, I mean, he was our friend. I posed for that one, too, and I did the illustration, and I had 
I purposely had him really, really you know, try, trying to move ahead, you know, and get his men to follow him. And he was the big leader. Hasbro got sick of seeing my face on a lot of the illustrations. And uh, so I said, sure, I said, okay. It became a big joke, though. <laughs> the Italian <laughs> G.I. Joe. <laughs> Unfortunately, do not have a large collection of G.I. Joe. I do have the foreign soldiers, which represent uh, the extended G.I. Joe line. They are beautifully done, and many times I look back and wonder how uh, we at Hassenfeld Brothers and Hasbro could possibly sell a soldier dressed in such gorgeous uniforms. Action soldiers of the world. We then ran into something called Vietnam. I was being called by um, different organizations at my home who happened to know I worked at Hasbro and they wanted me to boycott the place or to boycott toy stores because of war toys. And I said, well, that's how I make my living to myself. What am I going to do? Again in the toy business, when there is no confrontation, no war going on, uh, the graph of sales of military things like guns and soldiers and things like that goes very high because there's no confrontation. Little boys like to play with cowboys and Indians and soldiers. Once there is a war of some sort and our fellows are over there, it just completely drops and everybody starts complaining about it and we ran into that. You know, when I started thinking, am I do was what I'm doing wrong? I don't think so. People have, people have been playing with soldiers forever. People were saying G.I. Joe is a military toy and I don't want my kid having it. Uh, we found ourselves in a spot that we had to change Joe if he's going to continue. The idea came that he would be made an adventurer. The adventures of G.I. Joe. There are 11 different G.I. Joe adventure sets, each filled with exciting equipment. Here's the mouth of Doom Adventure. You get this complete jungle outfit, raft, pole, and crocodile. Could you save G.I. Joe? It's easy to find out. Each adventure comes with its own 16-page comic that tells the complete story. And look, there are three new G.I. Joes, too, including talking G.I. Joe astronaut. Landing party, now on moon. You can have a different adventure every day with all the new exciting G.I. Joe adventure sets. Get G.I. Joe today. It's G.I. Joe from Hasbro. About the time the adventure team concept came along, Bill Pugh of the Palatoy Company of England was sitting in front of his television set and he saw where some gentlemen in the town of Daventry were decorating glass bottles with a flocking to make vases. And it occurred to Bill that what would happen if we try to make real hair for G.I. Joe by electrostatically flocking the hair. This is the G.I. Joe adventure team. Five rugged men with lifelike hair. They're outfitted for action, and they take their orders from this man, the adventure team commander. I've got a tough assignment for you. I was the one who was to line up these various packages, and I referred to the National Geographic again and again. It was so easy for me to pick out an adventure that already had taken place, uh, like the Pygmy Gorilla or the White Tiger Hunt. Today's mission, capture the rare and dangerous White Tiger. Your own G.I. Joe will dare anything, risk everything. Look out, Joe! The G.I. Joe Talking Commander and the White Tiger Hunt are each purchased separately from G.I. Joe. The idea of the adventure team uh, was born. Um, initially, we had proposed character names, but Merrill Hasenfeld, Stephen's dad, was really adamant that you know, G.I. Joe is just one Joe, one character, and we persuaded uh, Hasbro that the adventures would be more exciting and the advertising would be more exciting if we could have a little snake in there with this uh, mummy and if we could have symbols of, of adventure play and, and challenge for uh, what was the new G.I. Joe adventure team. The uh, children's television audience is the smartest audience that there is. You better not uh, kid them, you better not mess around, you better not mislead them because they never forget. We didn't feel there was a benefit in trying to mask the fact that a child was involved with these products. We felt that by 
part, using the active play and the active participation, you would enhance the play experience and enhance the emotion of this. So that's what we try to do in our, in our commercial. So we had a lot of kid involvement. Uh, we uh, had the Joe diving through mud and underwater. We created rivers and streams and uh, did divers and all sorts of things. And a lot of backyard setups where with a few boulders and a hose and a rock, we would uh, create a realistic fantasy setting that kids could do in their own backyards, and often did, but also uh, could fantasize and imagine that these were jungles or you know, more uh, romantic, uh, adventurous places. You know, we, uh, over the years, created a lot of good adventures. We had a lot of great features. Every year we would try to come up with a gimmick or an idea that was a little bit different. We were involved in really everything that happened in the company in those days. It was a great time, wonderful time to, to be in the business. I joined Hasbro in January 1970. I was hired as Vice President of International Marketing. Before that, I had 25 years with Sears Roebuck as a national toy buyer, buying toys for the retail stores and the catalog. So we developed from each of the licensees a team, which we call Action Team. And we'd meet every year at Toy Fair in New York, and we'd meet together in Nuremberg. In fact, we had a big dinner, which was the annual G.I. Joe dinner in Nuremberg. The action team consisted of many countries. Uh, we had the polished steel from Italy. We called it Gijo. G.I. Joe, but pronounced Gijo. France was buying and importing Action Man and G.I. Joe from Hong Kong. So their new package in French was Action Joe. Palatoy in England continued with the Action Man, pronounced Action Man. Spain came up with theirs and called it Gaper Man. In Brazil, they called it Falcon. Germany, being very anti-military, just named theirs Action Team after the, the group. In the early years of licensing with the European countries, they couldn't afford to print individual boxes in their language. So we developed a plan where they would make standard boxes and then make inserts It would be inserted on the left side or the margin of the box. That way they could print five or ten different products, inserts, on one sheet. Each team, each team member, brought pictures and swatches of material samples of what he wanted in the line. So the maker in Hong Kong could duplicate them. And together, at our meetings, we would uh, develop a new program for the next year. It was truly an exciting and rewarding adventure for me to have been part of the action team in developing Joe throughout the world. Joe for years, you know, from 64 um, through the early 70s, was, you know, just was on a rise. And then we began to encounter, you know, the pressures with oil prices. The cost of plastic and uh, the ability to make a profitably make a product that um, we were trying almost everything we could think of to try to justify going uh, smaller in size and still giving a value to the kid. And so that's when we came. We played with first Super Joe, which took it down in size, but not you know by that much. <laughs> Introducing Super Joe Commander with a one-two punch. He also has a power light vest, so you can imagine he's ready at night with a beam of light. One pen light battery for each, not included. Uh-oh, it's Gore, king of the Terrans. Gore has a red power ray, but as you can imagine, Super Joe's ready with a beam of light. Imagine the fight. Imagine it. Lights out for Gore. It was really hard in those days to shrink down and down, and you know, we were trying to do it in millimeters, uh, and it wasn't working. We were watching kids begin to move away from Joe into, you know, other areas, and part of it was the pricing point. By 1980, most of the original G.I. Joe creative team had left Hasbro. Merrill Hassenfeld passed away in 1979. Merrill's eldest son, Stephen, became president of Hasbro. In 1981, uh, we started to seriously look at doing uh, G.I. Joe as a toy soldier. The idea of shrinking him down in size to three and three quarter inch. Uh, we picked three and three quarter inch because at the time, 
uh, a very successful boys brand, Star Wars, had come into the marketplace uh, based off the hit movie. We looked at Star Wars and we said, you know, there, there's a there's got to be another way of doing a three and three quarter inch figure. And we went back and looked at G.I. Joe and we said, well, what worked for G.I. Joe? And what really worked for G.I. Joe, we believed, was posability. And we took that same idea and scaled it down to three and three quarter inches. And where Star Wars figures maybe had six movable parts, we had 11. We would have the benefit uh, being able to make equipment and all the things that were so essential to G.I. Joe in a smaller size and therefore being more affordable. You know, having these giant vehicles was one of the problems of trying to maintain a 12-inch figure. There were two people in the marketing department, my boss, Bob Prupis, and myself. Bob was a driving force behind this concept. He knew how a retailer would buy this line. And one of the things he told us was, I want a line that's going to be collectible, I want it at various price points, and he said, I want it to be sold at retail, all of it, the entire first year line, for under $100. So that a kid could walk into a store throughout the year with his own spending money and buy a G.I. Joe figure. And then for Christmas, get the big wow. That really was the marketing plan. We uh, went to the company initially and to, to management, which was in that case really Stephen Hasselfeld, with a proposal that we develop a plan to try to bring back G.I. Joe. And we were thrown out, uh, rebuffed, uh, don't see how we can do it, Trey won't want it, all the, all the litany of reasons that everybody gives to, to say we uh, shouldn't do that. We all looked at each other like, oh my gosh, uh, six months of our lives were invested in this and he doesn't want to do it. And we discussed the fact that despite the fact that we've been given this directive to not bother with this, that what, what could we do? We said, come up with a concept that uh, is going to excite Stephen because if we can get him excited, then we have the green light for this project. If we can't get him excited, forget about it. He doesn't want anything to do with G.I. Joe again. Joe and I went back uh, to work and uh, came back, I think, about a month later for one of our product line reviews uh, with uh, uh, an extra presentation, a non-agenda presentation to talk about G.I. Joe. It began with a discussion that uh, basically said philosophically, Star Wars has the movie and they have reached X millions of kids and all that. And he says, well, we can't have the movie, but we can have, uh, we can have the book. And he held up a book, and the cover of, of which was uh, a mock-up, really, of what eventually became the cover of the first G.I. Joe comic book. And he said, Stephen, we've got a concept here that's never been done before. We are going to advertise a book to kids about G.I. Joe. But it's not just any book. It's a comic book. He said comic books have never been on television before. And we can do things in animation to bring the comic book to life that we can't do with a toy commercial. While that raised some interest, it wasn't until Joe Bacall got up and uh, presented uh, what uh, G.I. Joe, Real American Hero, was all about and played the music. G.I. Joe is fighting Cobra the enemy on land and sea and air. G.I. Joe, American Hero, shows chasing Cobra in a desperate race, soaring and diving in a great sky chase. G.I. Joe, Real American Hero. What's in store for G.I. Joe? Find out in Marvel Comics. Steven was up leaning against the back wall he wiped a tear from his eye and he said, guys, you did it. Really, Stephen was so uh, excited that he got in his car and he drove out to the cemetery where uh, Merrill was resting. And uh, as, he, as he told us, told his dad that uh, we're going to be able to bring back G.I. Joe. And uh, he'd be really proud of it and really excited about it. So it was, uh, uh, as we're all a close uh, family and a close group, it was a really touching moment for all of us. All war comics at the time had teams of guys. Sergeant Rock had his Easy Company, Nick Fury had his Howling Commandos, we had G.I. Joe. And instead of it being one individual guy or character, it was the code name for a team of guys. We picked up on the adventure theme and extended it with villains and heroes and characters and really fleshed it out into a whole new 
a new line, a whole, a whole new uh, a life for G.I. Joe. Over the, the years that G.I. Joe, the three and three quarter inch line was in existence, we sold close to uh, 500 million figures. That's a small army. I mean, that's, that's a large army. I shouldn't say a small army. That's a giant army. That's like probably every combined army in the world uh, is what that adds up to. But that's about what we sold in terms of that. And that's how successful it was. And that was just the United States and Canada. That had nothing to do with what was sold worldwide because G.I. Joe was and still is a worldwide concept. So, uh, yeah, if that, I think, can put it into some perspective how, how big and, and overwhelming it was. As the line went on for the next 12 to 14 years, we started immortalizing people we knew in plastic. And if you were on our good side, the marketing and R&D good side, uh, we'd find a way to get you in the G.I. Joe line. So, uh, of all the personalities that are in that line, I would say about 80 to 85 percent, the faces are sculpted. Uh, based on some real person who we came into contact with at Hasbro. And then uh, we even incorporated people's names on the bio cards. So if you didn't get your face pictured, you had your name on the back of the file card. It was kind of an in-joke that we had at Hasbro at the time that um, I think most people don't know about. Go, go from Hasbro. Every now and then, somebody from R&D would propose, let's redo the 12-inch figure. And every now and then it would get knocked down because we didn't want to confuse the marketplace. What is G.I. Joe? Is he 3 and 3 quarter inch? Is he 12 inch? And we just didn't believe the time was right. Well, about 1990, um, a buyer for Target approached Hasbro and our sales force and said, I am a big G.I. Joe fan and I really love the 12 inch figure. His name was Mark Pritchard. And Mark said, uh, let's work out a deal where I will have the exclusive rights to sell G.I. Joe 12-inch figure for six months or the first year, whatever, whatever it was, I don't remember now, but Mark was really instrumental in pushing us and a product manager who worked for me at the time, Vinny DeLeva, really took the bull by the horns along with an R&D guy, uh, Greg Bernston, and they developed the 12-inch G.I. Joe. At the time, you know, Desert Storm had just erupted. We did it in... Uh, desert camis. We made him Duke, one of the uh, three and three quarter inch characters. Target takes this 12 inch G.I. Joe figure and puts it in a special ad. They, went, they run it in their circular that comes out on a Sunday and uh, they say it's on sale at Target, only at Target. And by that following weekend, however many pieces we shipped were completely sold out. They came back and reordered you know, a second time, and uh, that gave us the encouragement to then develop a whole line of Hall of Fame figures. G.I. Joe doesn't get any bigger than this. The G.I. Joe Hall of Fame collection. Duke, Stalker, Snake Eyes, and Cobra Commander. Each 12 inches tall and authentically detailed. From Duke's lifelike hair to Cobra Commander's boots. They've got cloth uniforms, metal dog tags, and accessories like weapons cases and combat helmets. And each numbered collector's edition is armed with an awesome light and sound weapon for really big action. Cobra Commander, Snake Eyes, Stalker, and Duke sold separately from the G.I. Joe Hall of Fame collection. A whole new way to play. It was a return to the 12-inch size. Dads of 1990 were going back to when they were you know, kids in 1964 and bought their very own G.I. Joe. And I think that's one of the interesting things about the phenomenon of G.I. Joe is that it has been so long-lived that you've had generations now of people who have played with a G.I. Joe. And uh, there's that link, almost like baseball, where a father teaches his son how to play baseball, a father can teach his son how to play with G.I. Joe. And there's that link that has carried on for the last 30 years. Stephen Hassenfeld passed away in 1989. His younger brother, Alan, became CEO of Hasbro. We had discovered that there were these little groups of people out there in, across America who were having miniature G.I. Joe conventions. They were collecting G.I. Joes, primarily the 12 inch. The three and three quarter inch always was meant to try and get the kids back in. 
Um, and we were giving, you know, we weren't spending the time with the collector. Today, for me, one of my passions is that whole collector business. You know, my first G.I. Joe when I was seven. That was a uh, Christmas present for my grandmother. We were watching G.I. Joe commercials when they first came out. I put on my Christmas list that I wanted a soldier. I got my first action sailor, I think in 1966. All I wanted for Christmas was the space capsule. My older brother and I got the space capsule on the same Christmas morning and helped each other put the labels on the interior of the space capsule. I can remember it very fondly. After the third day of pulling me out of school, she said, all right, what's it going to take for you to go to school all day long? And I said, Mom, I want a G.I. Joe. And that's how I got my first G.I. Joe. When we first took over the club, there were about 200 members in the club. And we've grown up to about the 4,000 level today. And we do the uh, international conventions for Hasbro. You know, we sell all their items, so it's really exciting expanded into a lot of different things. What I do is I try to find people's collections, buy them out, and um, keep obviously the things that I want and the nicer things and, and then sell off the extras. And I, I don't try to make a huge profit. I'm not in it to make money. I'm into it to actually feed my own fever, basically. The thing about G.I. Joe collectors or anyone that comes to convention, you can look around. We've got all races, all creeds, many different nationalities, white collar, blue collar. There is no one. We've got old, we've got young. G.I. Joe is the quintessential American hero and collecting G.I. Joe cross cuts all demographic lines. My mom had put away my collection from when I was a kid and I had a, a Jeep and a trailer and four G.I. Joes and then a footlocker filled with gear and I looked through there and I started seeing I was missing a helmet from one set and a rifle from another set so I started out by trying to replace what I had as a child. I've got way too many vintage figures out because it's become uh, I like to say an obsession. Some people say an addiction. No matter where I go, uh, if I'm wearing any type of G.I. Joe logo to apparel, people come up to me that I don't know and they'll tell me a story about G.I. Joe. So I've decided that almost everyone has a story about G.I. Joe. So one of the reasons we do this convention and move it around the country is so that we attract different people and maybe they'll have that memory or they'll go, you know, I had G.I. Joe, I, I think I'll call my mom and see whatever happened to those. young gentleman who was a writer approached me and said he'd like to co-author a book with me about G.I. Joe. He said I'd like to put in the book or with the book the original G.I. Joe whether you could resurrect the tools overseas or whatever. That that piqued my interest the fact that it wasn't a book it was a book and G.I. Joe. I went to the Orient and I bought the tools and those things that weren't available after 30 years we retooled and we came up with the old G.I. Joe. And we put this masterpiece edition together. Because of that, over the last couple of years, uh, we and my company create G.I. Joe specials for Hasbro called Timeless Edition. And there are a lot of people, collectors out there, that say this was the original one. And uh, we do nicely with that. So we're still involved with that famous guy named uh, G.I. Joe. I was restoring a G.I. Joe head, and I had stripped all the paint off of it, and the lighting wasn't that great where I, where I was working at, and I was going to repaint the face, and I had held the uh, head up to the light to start to work on the eyes, when all of a sudden it struck me like a ton of bricks. 
that G.I. Joe, the head of G.I. Joe, looked like JFK, like John Kennedy. Now I gotta prove it. Is it really JFK? I called the National Archives and I requested photographs of JFK. And then I shot the head at the same angle that the photographs were taken of JFK to put them side by side in the book to show the illustration. The hairline was identical. The cleft in the chin was identical. The crook in the nose was identical. The eyebrows even, and this was the thing that was very unique, G.I. Joe has his hair combed a certain way and it was the typical JFK hairstyle, which was very unique back in the 60s because crew cuts was a style and JFK had this special type of hairstyle. I can see how you would find a resemblance uh, anytime you're doing a doll's face or that type of a face, small especially, you want to really have very strong features on it and John Kennedy had very strong features. So I can certainly see where there'd be a resemblance. You know, if very square jaw, that type of rugged good looks. Through the years, many collectors have asked me if Phil Krakowski had JFK in mind when he sculpted G.I. Joe's head. Uh, the answer from Phil was, no, not really, but he had done medals of JFK and he's also done busts previously in 1961 and 1962. So the resemblance may have just come out incidentally. Hasbro recently produced a G.I. Joe figure based on John F. Kennedy's days as a PT boat commander. So ultimately, G.I. Joe would end up looking like JFK. G.I. Joe is very important to Hasbro. It's one of the brands that the company really was founded on. Every year, Hasbro produces an entirely new line of G.I. Joes, and we try to keep it fresh every year by coming up with all, all new characters, whether they are um, different military roles, um, important historical figures, a variety of eras. We try to do all those as authentically and historically accurate as possible with the detail as correct as we can down to the last badge or button or the hairstyle that they would have worn. One of the things that's particularly interesting working on the G.I. Joe line is the sense of history that you get and all the research that we do. There's a great historical value in going back to find out about heroes whom you never read about as a kid who were everyday guys, and, and gals for that matter, steel workers, farmers, uh, you know, who, who went off to war and are now depicted in an action figure. And you feel very good about bringing that stuff into products, bringing that history to life. G.I. Joe is just such a large icon and encompasses so much of America and American values and uh, those people who in generations past would give the supreme ultimate sacrifice for their country that uh, you kind of have to build a shelf for all of them. You know, one of the things that I'd like to see us do, and it's still cost prohibitive today, but we're working on technology where maybe, Mitch, at one point in time you'd come and you'd basically say, you know, I'd like my own G.I. Joe with my face. Um, I think in time we might be able to customize, not only have a collector piece, but something that, that also is you. A lot of dreams, a lot of goals, a lot of aspirations for G.I. Joe, and um, it'll happen. The first we heard about uh, G.I. Joe being a collector's item was when we got a phone call about the G.I. Joe convention at the Kennedy Space Center, and that would we like to come? And I said, sure we would, but what's this all about? And uh, Mike Hertz proceeded to tell me that G.I. Joe's a big collector's item, there's a big convention, and all that will be required of, uh, of me is to sign some autographs and talk at some uh, breakfast and whatnot. And I said, are you kidding me, Mike? Is this, uh, this some sort of candid camera thing? You have to sign autographs. I couldn't believe it. I said, you've got to be kidding. No. Hey, we received our airline tickets and we met uh, several others at the airport. I'm saying something's very familiar about them. And I said, for heaven's sake, that's Sam Spears and Jerry Einhorn. Well, it was so great to see them. I had not seen them for all the years I'd been away from Hasbro when I, I left in 60, 1965. Taken to a condominium complex where we were put up for several days. And uh, who was there to greet us was Don Levine. So Don right away says, well, it looks like it's time for a meeting. <laughs> so, 
And so we did. We all went into the, the lounge to have a drink. It was just so neat to have um, to be there. That very next morning, we were driven to the uh, visitor center at the Kennedy Space Center. And as we were getting out of the uh, van, we noticed a line of people lined up outside the door. I said, what's this for? And one of the other guys said, they're waiting for you. My head was so large, I could not believe, I said, this has got, they've got to have the wrong person here. That was when the book was introduced, The Legend of G.I. Joe, uh, John Nicklick and Don Levine's book, and uh, we had to sign these uh, books. People with two or three boxes of these books, now these books are $60 a piece. They buy three at a time, and uh, you had to sign a special way. They even have pens, special pens they wanted you to sign with. And this particular page, and a page that they had it all opened up, where I said what I said in John's book, I had to put my name there and say a little something. They'd tell you their life story. I mean, why G.I. Joe was important to them. Uh, a black fellow threw his arms around me and said, you know, I didn't never have a father. I never had a father. G.I. Joe was my dad. Another person worked for Walt Disney Studios as a result of looking at the artwork. Another man came up and he says, you know, I just completed 20 years in the Army and I would have never joined the Army if it hadn't been for G.I. Joe. And there was just endless lines of people coming in and just so thrilled over, you know, G.I. Joe and so thrilled over beating me because I was an artist that did the first ones and all that. <laughs> and it was quite thrilling to be to him. And they wanted to know what it was like to have been part of this team. Well, you see, at the time, we didn't know we were on anything special. We had such a ball doing it, we didn't know it was going to be like this. A lot of people, including myself, take a lot of credit for G.I. Joe because we did work hard and we made it happen. Every little intricacy about G.I. Joe we were concerned about. But nothing, nothing at all would have happened. No one in the world would ever know the name G.I. Joe and place it with an action figure without a fellow named Merrill Hassenfeld. It was okay for us to be drawing our salaries and doing our jobs, correctly so. But if this fellow didn't have the courage and the fortitude and the trust in all of us, there would be no G.I. Joe. One of the things that I'm sorry that my father never got a chance to see was where it is that Hasbro you know, has gone and, and what we've become because no man ever set a better table for two sons and then my father did and then my brother took up the gauntlet brilliantly. I think dad would probably say, hey, I got you, you know, I got you into this business. I took you here. Now you've got to live with this new economy uh, and, the, and the way things are changing. I just, you know, most passionately want to make sure um, that Joe is here forever and a day. Pretend there's trouble for G.I. Joe. You gotta get out. Your G.I. Joe Copters waiting Time to go Gotta rescue G.I. Joe Better move out Your G.I. Joe Mission accomplished G.I. Joe